Hi there, my name is Nick Martellaro and I'm an assistant professor at the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Today I want to talk to you about design ideation for AI products and services. So I come uh, from a design-oriented background and I often think about uh, creating new things uh, as a form of design inquiry. What that means is really doing an investigation of uh, new uh, technologies um, and new products and services uh, through the use of a design process. And oftentimes what we're doing there is giving form to something through sort of a reflective conversation with the material. So we think of AI as a material and we're sort of working with that to create something new and then going out and seeing how do people interact with it and where do we create value with that. Now oftentimes what that means is in the process we're repeatedly reframing a problem that we have that we're trying to solve with the use of that technology and we're trying to ideate many different solutions to form uh, the right thing for us to design. Um, this is often what we do when we're sort of sketching ideas, prototyping ideas, and we can do the same things with AI-based systems. Um, and then we refine our ideas through constant sort of iteration and prototyping of those um, new technologies, new services, new products uh, with people, especially in a human-centered uh, design process. Uh, so in regards to design processes, um, there's all kinds of processes, but one really common one is the design council's double diamond, where the first phase is really thinking about what's the right thing to build, and then the second phase is uh, how do you build it right? And these kind of, you go through sort of these convergent and divergent um, thinking phases where you're sort of thinking of lots of ideas and then coming together to sort of define a problem and then start delivering on a solution. Now, during this process, oftentimes we as designers are reframing uh, what that problem is. So a frame is an assumption or a perspective on a situation. And this is actually often given to um, uh, designers and then they take that and uh, as a problem and then the designers actually frame uh, that problem um, from a client. Then often what we do is we reframe by challenging the current assumptions that either the clients made or we have about the situation. One of the things to understand about this is that this is really more of a design innovation rather than a technical innovation. So whereas technology innovation is the invention of new things, new tech, to advance um, what we're trying to do. A design innovation is actually thinking a little more about the assembly of known technologies in a useful and desirable new form. And oftentimes design innovations require a reframing of a problem to sort of take and shift the mindset of how a technology could work or where a technology is valuable and frame it in a different light. And often this happens after the technical innovation is really made. One of the things, too, to remember here is that reframing is a dialogue between technology, users, and the designers. So we're thinking about all three things together. So an example, and actually my colleague John Zimmerman likes to use this one, is the Philips cassette recorder, so the, the cassette tape player. Uh, this was a technical innovation, uh, something that could basically take tape media and play audio. Then it was reframed, and actually there were innovations on that for all kinds of people, all kinds of uses, all kinds of contexts. So if you wanted to take your music and make it portable, maybe you wanted it portable with you uh, out when you're, um, say, at a basketball court. That's the boom box. Or maybe you want to listen to your tapes in the car. That's going to be the in-car cassette player. Or maybe you wanted to have it uh, for your own music, you know, just for yourself, um, and while you're walking around, the Walkman. There were also innovations on recording, so basically uh, transferring music from one tape to another and then being able to kind of do that dynamically, allowing people to make mixtapes. One thing to remember here is that basically all of these can be thought of as sort of design innovations and reframings based on sort of users' needs, desires, wants, or, but they're all fundamentally rooted in what the tape technology could actually deliver. Another example is ride sharing and Uber. So if we think about uh, Uber as a service to help people get around uh, via a car-based transportation, uh, that's one way to think about it. <clears throat> but really Uber is a logistics system. And it was reframed, for example, here in uh, Pennsylvania as a service to get people to uh, the polls, to allow them to vote. So rather than it being sort of a taxi service, it was actually uh, uh, viewed as a way, to, as a transportation service to get people to vote. So it's a way to enable voting. 
And then Uber themselves actually reframed, knowing that they had these sort of fundamental logistics capabilities, these abilities to dynamically uh, uh, get workers uh, to pick things up, pick people up, and put them in uh, new places. They realized they could do that in a completely different context, which was food delivery. Uh, they realized they didn't even need to do it with uh, vehicles, with cars. They could actually do it with cyclists, skateboarders, you know, any way that you got around, as long as uh, they could use their fundamental technology. And this created new value for Uber, actually, in many cases, a more valuable um, arm of their business. So when we kind of think about where design innovation happens on the double, on the double diamond, um, a user-centered design process is often moving kind of from left to right here. So we discover user needs, we understand them, we then start to envision solutions based on our understanding of those needs. Then we think of all the ways that we can sort of create those solutions, we prototype them, and then we assess and we figure out how well it's going to work and, and, and really how we're going to implement. And so really that user-centered design process is focused on researching needs, developing personas and scenarios, developing a solution, and then evaluating that benefit to the user. However, with AI-based systems and thinking about um, new kinds of AI-driven things, we might actually take a different approach. And this is an approach that was uh, actually suggested by um, Bly and Churchill in sort of in uh, the late 90s. Um, but that it's a process called matchmaking. And in matchmaking, you really start with a fundamental technology sort of in the middle. You have this capability, this thing to do. And then you actually can explore backwards and forwards. You can kind of go backwards and start to understand from a user's perspective, where could this be valuable? And then you start to design forwards and start to think of all the different things that that technology can do. So what are all the capabilities that it could have that it could, where it could potentially provide value? And so again, the focus here is on the technological capability as the starting point. So in this case, we might think about AI systems. And what we're doing is we're mapping those technical capabilities to human activities. And we're trying to identify domains where the, that technical capability might provide a benefit. And we select good targets and we give forms to different products and services and we evaluate what kind of value it does. And then we kind of go into sort of where that value is. Once we define a really great use case, you then start to go back to your human-centered design process and to doing great usability um, and user experience work to actually make those, uh, make those uh, technologies work in an effective manner and to really deliver that value. But we use matchmaking as this way of kind of identifying those valuable ways to apply this new technology to really reframe where that technology could be used. Now, there's a couple of challenges in designing human AI interaction and designing AI products and services. And actually, there's this great paper from Young um, et al. in 2020 um, that talks about two kind of primary component, two kind of primary challenges. One is the uncertainty surrounding AI's capabilities and the fact that for many designers, it's really uncertain um, what AI can actually do. And then also the complexity of the output that AI is giving us. So in regards to the AI capability uncertainty, there's sort of two kinds. There's existing capability AI systems and emergent AI systems and their capabilities. Uh, for existing things, this might include things like, say, um, computer vision-based uh, um, object ident identifiers. Uh, these are actually now pretty, pretty stable. They're pretty um, uh, usable, and uh, they work pretty well. We kind of know what they can do. This actually allows teams to really quickly build on new products and build new products and services because they understand what this thing can do. <clears throat> and so now it's really applying it to different areas. However, you're often limited in what's possible based on the data. Um, so if you use a pre-trained model, for example, you can kind of only do what that model does. Whereas if you want to actually um, build your own capabilities, that's going to take a lot more work. That doesn't mean it's not valuable, but it is something to note. Now, we also can think about more emerging capabilities. Now, these can create all kinds of new values specific to a certain product domains, and this is really a really cool jumping point uh, to think about from a matchmaking perspective, which is where could this be used? However, oftentimes it's really uncertain how good these models are and what kind of value they really do create. Uh, one example of an emergent capability, at least of them now, is uh, generative um, AI systems for both text and, say, images. They're starting to work. They're starting to work pretty well. But we still haven't figured out exactly where they provide value. Whereas, say, more traditional things like um, <clears throat> uh, computer vision systems for object identification or segmentation have already found lots of uses. And we can actually even think and reframe uh, different use cases into other domains and generate value very quickly. Now, the other area of challenge is in AI output complexity. Uh, and this is really, there's kind of three different levels that I like to think about. One is simple outputs, and this is really binary classification. Hot dog, not hot dog. Is it a thing? Is it not a thing? 
This is actually really easy to do, and oftentimes if you can do that and you can simplify your problem, this makes your ability to kind of create value uh, a little bit easier. Now you can kind of increase your complexity into more multi-class classification problems, like say identifying the breed of dogs rather than just identifying a dog or not dog, or doing things like simple predictions, for example, logistic linear regressions or even boosted regression models now. Um, but you're still kind of predicting something that is fairly reasonable that you could uh, imagine predicting. Then you can get into really complex things, and this is where it gets really hard. This is where things like content generation or really complex prediction, so for example, predicting the stock market, basically still impossible. Um, and so this is something where you're trying to figure out, and designers are really tasked with, how complex is what I'm trying to do? So these two things really, is this an emergent capability, and is it a really complex thing? Is it an emergent capability, but it's really simple? Helps you to kind of think about, well, where can we kind of go and find value? Now. In terms of ideation and thinking about where's the starting place for, for thinking about where we can provide value with AI and where I often think about this, I actually really like this uh, metaphor from Google, which is the drunk island metaphor. And so you're imagining AI actually as a bunch of drunk people on an island who are doing tasks for you. They don't do those tasks very well because they're drunk. However, there's a lot of them and they can do it sort of. And so you could scale up really, really well and you get output that's okay. The question there is where do you really find value in that? One really good example uh, that we often give is in the automated transcription for uh, voice message systems. Um, these uh, work and they're okay, uh, but you've probably used this before and you know that it's not a perfect transcription. However, it doesn't need to be to actually provide value to people. For example, if it can tell you the difference between a message from your doctor's office telling you you should call back, well you can look at that quickly and go, I'll call back versus say a spam message where you can quickly get rid of that. So again, it's providing value and it allows, it's allowable to work for lots and lots of people, but it doesn't have to be perfect. And so in regards to how I like to think about this and what we often teach our students is, where are those starting points where you can think about something where it doesn't actually have to be that good, so the prediction model doesn't need to be perfect, but it would be way better to have than not having it at all. And where would it be really awesome where you can scale it up um, and actually make it work for lots and lots of things where you might not be able to ha uh, do that before with other types of systems. So I look forward to seeing you in the class because we'd really like to talk more about these ideas, thinking about how we can apply design methods to um, developing new human AI interaction. See you in the class.